Hello, everybody, and welcome to the very last week of Marriage and Kinship. We have come so far since this course started. So today, what I want to take the opportunity to do is to revisit the place that we started and see if we still agree with it or if there are fundamental concepts that we need to reconsider. So let's start. Right at the beginning of the semester, we provisionally defined kinship as a way or ways of determining who is important to us or connected to us, quote unquote, family. Now, just in case you don't remember this, this definition came from me, your professor, and not any of the readings. But what I want you to think about and talk about in the comments is, how might you define it now, given everything that we've read? So what does biological family even mean? If you think about Moore's work on sperm donors or Karsten's work on the ways that people can become biologically related through shared food, um, Wolf Meyer's work on the ways that people can become biologically related through other kinds of exchanges of biological material, um, Eliana Kim's work about how blood continues to link Korean adoptees to Korea, even in the absence of known kin, um, much the same with Freco and her co-authors in terms of whether adoption can make somebody really part of the family or really Spanish. Is, does the blood get in the way? What does biological family even mean? And relatedly, I want to ask you, to what extent are people free to make chosen family? Or phrased another way, to what extent is all family chosen? Is family given to us or is it that we choose to follow the norms of the culture around us? We also had a couple really basic definitions at the beginning of the semester, and I want to revisit those too. We talked about consanguinity. Again, this idea of sharing blood, or more specifically, relationships determined by genetics. We also talked more specifically amongst consanguineous relations. We have these relationships that we talk about as descent, usually in terms of a descent group, people who share descent from a common ancestor. So, do we need these words? Are these words useful to us in an analytical sense? I think they are almost certainly useful for thinking about how individual people within a culture might think about their relationships. But in a broader sense, when we, when we think about what kinship is, are these terms that we need? So, today I want to talk about our author, Marshall Sollins, who unfortunately passed away recently. Um, in honor of him, let us have this discussion of his concept of mutuality of being. And for Sollins, this is what ultimately defines kinship. And when we talk about consanguinity, that is perhaps only one form of mutuality of being. So he defines it as persons who are members of one another, who participate intrinsically in each other's existence. When we talk about being a blood relation to someone, we very often talk about like the same blood flowing in our veins, that part of me is in them and part of them is in me and that is what makes us the same we participate intrinsically in each other's existence we can do it with genetics too the first time i saw my niece and she smiled i saw that she had these 
little dimples. And you know what? My sister doesn't have dimples, but my mom does. And I've got one lopsided dimple and I could see the genetic relationship to me in my niece's face. And I was like, oh my God, this kid is, she's part of me. She looks related to me. There's this thing that's being shared. It hit me like a train. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, maybe, maybe this idea that sharing genes is important is actually like really emotionally powerful. But in addition to thinking about consanguinity as kind of mutual being, one kind of mutual being, perhaps mutuality of being helps us unite ideas about being biologically related in some way with what Solins discusses as postnatal kinship. And postnatal kinship basically means kinship that you acquire after you are born. Presumably you are born into a family, into some kind of kinship structure, but that's not the end of your kin making strategies. It's just being born isn't the beginning and the ending of who you're related to, right? So Solins tells us a catalog of commonplace postnatal means of kinship formation would include commensality, that is like living together, sharing food, reincarnation, co-residence, shared memories, working together, adoption, friendship, shared suffering, and so on. So if we replace concepts like consanguinity and affinity and descent with mutuality of being, does this make kinship meaningless as a separate and unique kind of social relationship. Okay, so this is going to be a little complicated because this is me describing what Marshall Solins says about what David Schneider says. But we are, again, going back to the beginning, going back to David Schneider. So Solins argues that Schneider believed that kinship is a meaningless category of analysis. It is only Western ethnocentrism that believes that blood is thicker than water and therefore gives kinship a special place in studies of human social organization. Maybe kinship isn't special. Maybe it's not even real. Maybe the way humans form different groups in society is interesting, but we don't need this kinship category of special groups. But Solins, arguing across years, responds, this doesn't mean that kinship can be anything or that kinship doesn't exist as a distinct mode of group formation. Redefining kinship as mutuality of being doesn't mean that kinship can just be any kind of group at all. So again, what does mutuality of being mean? Mutual relations of being, participation in one another's existence. Mutuality of being is about the extent to which part of us actually, like physically, spiritually, in some essential way, resides in someone else, or at least how we understand a part of ourselves to also reside in someone else, and how we understand a part of another person to, again, in some essential way, to reside in us. So in this sense, Soulmates are, of course, kin because their, their souls are mates, right? That is a very straightforward example of postnatal mutuality of being, kinship. But what I really like 
about mutuality of being as a concept even more than anything else is the way that it not only describes what kinship is, but at the same time, it specifies how people may become kin to each other. The process of becoming kin or recognizing somebody as kin is recognizing that you have some shared essence. Finally, Salins argued that kinship has a particular kind of content, that being kin is a different kind of social role than being a coworker or being a friend. And once somebody becomes kin, they take on the very specific roles of kin. So, um, like I just said, kin relationships maybe, unlike other kinds of social relationships, have a delimited kind of content. And once someone is acknowledged as kin, you are also then tied to particular ways of behaving with that person, just as they are tied to particular ways of behaving with you. And as an example of this, he talks about the Trukies category, my sibling from the same canoe, which refers to people who sustained each other through a life-threatening trial at sea. You know, if you go through a life-threatening experience with somebody, you might be close to them forever. And Sullins then quotes another scholar, Mac Marshall, who says, The term refers to men who shared a disabled canoe, drifted together at sea for many days, supporting each other's flagging spirits and sharing completely what meager food and water they had until they finally reached land or were rescued at sea. Born of mutual aid and adversity, these men swear eternally to treat each other like brothers. They would take care or look after one another, cooperate, agree to be of one mind, share land or other resources. These phrases encapsulate the essence of proper kinship feeling, that this is what kinship for the Trukis should be and is exemplified by siblings from the same canoe and the promises that they make to each other. So I want to ask you, too, about your own postnatal kin. Do you treat them differently to other kin? Or do they occupy the same kinds of place in your life? Do you expect the same things from them that you expect from anybody that you call family? So thank you for this little trip down memory lane with me. And I will see you next time for our very last lecture.